Design's a funny thing. As designers, we sit down and we doodle, draw, go back, erase, redraw, refine, do better, keep drawing, maybe scan it, put it into Photoshop, redraw it, rework it, go back, rearrange it. Maybe we chuck it out and start again. That's design. And this whole process of going back and reworking and redoing and refining is the process that's being used now in many management practices. It's something that we as designers have been doing for years and years. I'm going to move back to the early days of computing. And the early days of computing, and that is Grace Hopper, who was one of the original pioneers of computing. And it was Grace Hopper who actually coined the word bug. She was actually programming one day and uh, her program wasn't working and she went and had a look at the tape. Uh, and in those days it was paper tape. And she realized that a bug, had, uh, an insect, had been caught in the ta- tape uh, that she was using and that's how the word bug became coined. Many women worked in computing in the early days and hopefully one day many women will again. So what happened in the early days of computing was that code was developed in a sequential manner. People wrote the code, they tinkered with the code, they fixed the code and as a project develops um, Often it was very difficult to remember all the different changes and all the bugs that you had to fix. This led to this idea of having a big bang bug fix at the end where they'd go through and fix all the code and fix all the things that were wrong with it. However, those of us who know anything about usability realize that if you don't constantly test throughout a project, you have all sorts of problems with usability. And these problems are often not detected early on in program development. Now this problems with um, this whole big bang sort of system of project management left to all sorts of problems and this led to the waterfall method of project management. Now the waterfall method of project management looked a bit like this. You started off with the feasibility of a project, you started to do some plan, you designed, you build, you tested, um, you set it out to production and you um, then after you put it in production you provided support to the users. Um, which just seems like a reasonable way of doing things. You sort of start at the beginning and work through the project and at the end you you test it and then you put it live and support it and it it all seems really good. The problems with Waterfall were, of course, that adding just one more feature often led to project scope and project scope creep. And, And this impacted upon the feasibility of the entire project. Now, the Waterfall methodology has limited flexibility. And once it's defined, it's very difficult to change the project. And because testing doesn't happen until the end of the project, it becomes quite expensive to make changes. The other problem is that there's limited customer involvement. There's no usability testing, and this means that users only found systems hard to use and market needs were often missed. Only 20% of the total capabilities of the systems were being used, and this was often used due to bad user interface design, bad information architecture, bad usability design, appalling user experience design, and the problems with waterfall just kept on mounting. So, the spiral method started off where you understand the requirements, you design the system, you build in stages, you test and evaluate, and you go around and around again in a spiral method. Changes um, to the waterfall resulted in this method and what this allowed was um, prototyping and incremental product design. And this very much closely follows the way that we work as designers. You start off with a rough sketch and then you refine, you refine, you refine. You make changes, you tinker, you change, you go back, you do it again. But each time you change something, the design gets more and more refined. And this is the the methodology um, that we use in the spiral production method, um, production um, methodology. Now, there's nothing wrong with the spiral method. It's a very good method. It works extremely well for user experience design, particularly when you're um, designing um, through paper prototype testing, wireframing, and then high fidelity prototype testing before going on and creating the final project. Spiral method's fine, and it worked in the mid-1980s. But it doesn't work for every project. So this led in the 1990s to the rapid application development. 
And um, RAD um, evolved and it, and it looks something like this. You had an analysis and you did a quick design. Then you demonstrate, refine, develop, and then you test before you deploy. And you do this for different stages of the project. So it's, it's not that you do the whole project, you do little sections of it. And um, the rapid, rapid application development relied on building prototypes. And the really good thing about this production methodology was that rapid application development allowed you to build prototypes to allow requirements to emerge from the process of developing the thing itself. Frequent feedback is elicited from users. The Scrum and the XP Extreme Program methodologies took their roots from rapid application um, development. And in RAD, there's very, very heavy focus on short iterations. Now, what we mean is you don't let the project draw out over a long period. You create the project in small, sizable chunks and you rapidly deploy. So the current sweetheart of production management, if you like, is known as Agile. And you might have heard our Prime Minister talk about it recently. Agile is also known as design thinking. And this is sort of how it works. It very much has its basis off RAD and the spiral method. So you start. At the early stages, you need to initiate your project. You define your project requirements. Then you do your first development cycle. When you reach the end of your cycle, you should have complete working software. And at this stage, you integrate and test. Then you move on to the next thing or part of the program that you need to develop. You complete it, and at the end, you test. And at every stage, and at every little bit of the, of the, of the software package, every little section of it is fully completed for each Agile cycle, and at the end, it's tested. Now, the good thing about the Agile methodology is it allows for feedback. At the end of each cycle or the end of each Agile cycle, you allow for feedback. Um, you have a whole review, your feedback. If it is approved, fine, release. If it's not approved, you record and implement changes, adjust your track, and go around for the next iteration. The really good thing about the Agile development is you're constantly asking um, for feedback from the users. The users are embedded into the development cycle. So Agile methodology has a thing called the Agile Manifesto. And this is how we go about the Agile, Agile Manifesto. We're, it, un, we're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and by helping others to do it. And this is what you have to do when you're developing using Agile. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. And that is what we're saying is that, the, that these all, thing, all, all of these are of value, but the ones that are in bold, the ones that are on the left-hand side of this screen are more important than the ones on the right-hand side came across this really good um, drawing of um, the Agile methodology. And this is, and this is how, it, how, how we work in Agile. It's change is the thing that we need to encompass in the Agile methodology. And the other thing is about how you work as a team. Now, in the old, bad old days of, of production management, you'd have the big boss in the office possibly on a floor, four, four, three or four stories up, and then you might have the project manager who worked in an office sort of down the corridor and around the corner, and then you had your team members. They might, they might be working in a, in a shared office, but they might be spread out all over the place. The key to working with the Agile methodology is to work together. So all members of the Agile team are co-located. So you sit together, you talk together, you work together. And the other thing about the Agile methodology is that you embrace change. The change is seen to be welcome. You're looking for technical excellence, you're looking for self-organizing teams. So in these teams, 
it's not that you've got a rigid production manager telling you what to do. It's the other way around. You turn it around. It's the teams who are saying what they do. And it's the teams who are defining what needs doing. You deliver your project frequently. So you don't leave the big project so you've got one big bloated thing that's delivered at the end. You're frequently showing it to your clients. You're frequently delivering. And you're working with a shorter time scale. You're not leaving it for weeks and weeks. The time scale that you're using is a week or two weeks, four weeks possibly at the most. Looking for good design. You're looking for something that actually works. So that's the Agile manifesto. So what is Agile? Agile allows, project methodology allows a large project to be broken up into smaller chunks. Items are broken up into small, logical chunks of work, and we call these iterations sprints. And it's useful when you've got problems like design, where you've got a wicked problem, where you've got problems where you've got multiple stakeholders, where the design ideas keep changing, where the business needs um, or when the business needs to see benefits a lot earlier. And agile methodology is frequently used for information technology projects. So what makes for a good agile sprint? Now, a lot of the agile books say that you really should have four to 12 weeks per sprint. However, I've done a little bit of a tiny quiz and I came across two kind of major IT clients that I know about who actually do two week sprints. So I've brought this back to a two to 12 week sprint. And the two clients that I think are important enough to pay attention to is Adobe. Adobe here in Sydney works on a two week sprint cycle. And the other client that I know of is Steve Faulkner who walks, works for Infinite Interact, Interactive down in Melbourne. He's got his own, he's one of Australia's best well-known seasoned gaming producers. And he works on a two week sprint. So I figure if it works for them, it probably could work for us. Face-to-face -face communication has to be emphasized over any other form. Email, telephone is all an imprecise methodology of, of communication because a whole lot of information is lost. Facial expression, body language, face-to-face -face is always to be prioritized over any other communication channel. The teams are co-located. You have a 100% committed sponsor, and this sponsor is known as the project owner. Another word for that is the boss. Now this could be the person whose project it is, it could be the client, or it could be the person who's overseeing the project. But this person is the person who has ownership of the project. It's their baby, it's their creative, creative baby. They're the ones who are calling the shots, if you will. And the other thing that we like about agile projects, the ones that are good, is that requirement changes are anticipated and are accommodated. So changes are welcome. So you have to have a vision for the end game. You all have to understand the life cycle of the project. All of the requirements must be understood by all team members. You must use a shared and managed schedule and all team members have to have access to this schedule. You have to have a dedicated team now communication is crucial for Agile methodology. So we have a bunch of Agile stages. Envision, speculate, explore, adapt, and close. So I'm gonna take you through the different stages now. The first stage that you start off is the Envision stage. And this is where you define and build your project. It's where you hire your team and it's a way you develop the values and norms of the team. Now in the envisage cycle, you need to document what it is that you're doing, who's doing what, who's in your team, what teams you have, uh, what tools you have to use in your team. So for example, computers with certain amounts of software, what sort of software you need to use. You need to outline the scope of your project. You need to define what your project is and what your project isn't. And if something beyond um, falls beyond the scope of this project, it might be that somebody comes up with a really good idea, but you don't have the time or the budget to, to, to do that really cool thing that you've come up with. So then you define it as being outside the budget. And if the client wants to have to go forward with that new cool idea, that would be a new project. 
You need to define who your stakeholders are. You need to have your team collaboration tools set up and working. You need to establish team norms. And these are things like, what hours do you work? How are you going to solve problems? And then you cycle through the speculate, explore and adapt for each sprint. Now, at the end of the Envision stage, Envision is quite a slow, it's, it's the first part of the cycle and it does take time to set up. You must have documentation at the end of your production of your, your Envision stage. So there should be a document which outlines your schedule, which outlines your team members, which outlines the equipment that you need and it also outlines your budget your clients and all the other stakeholders. So if you don't have this document, you're not doing it properly. Now the project charter defines the scope of the project and it should contain the vision or the grand idea surrounding the project. You need to know who your target users are, what the key benefits of the project is, and what the purpose of this project is. And these the scope is the key responsibility of the owner and the scrum master. Now there's a new word, scrum master. On the bad old days we used to call the scrum master the production manager. The scrum master is the person who oversees and removes roadblocks from the um, project. So we have two key members, the owner, that vision thing, the person who's got the vision, the person who's saying yes or no or we do it um, to the project and you've got your scrum master. Now, your collaboration tools. Your collaboration tools should track and provide the status of where you're at in the project at all times. They should facilitate joint feature development. They should push information out to team members. And you should start with simple tools and then add them as required. Now, the tool that I suggest you have a look at is one called Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O. Trello is a really good production management tool. It's online and it's free for the first project or so that you do. Um, now during the Envision stage, all team members work on together on the overall design of the project and they work on it and they define it. It's not really a top-down process. It's more of a bottom-up process where all team members are involved. And through this working on the Envision and working, uh, working out the collaboration tools and working out how you're going to work together, you establish your team norms. What is, good, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable behaviour. Now the team norms um, are things like active listening, attacking the problem and not the person, seeking to understand the problem first, only putting focus on this sprint and this feature. Now there's a word we haven't used before, feature. A feature is a unit of work. It's a task that you have to do. And when you first set up your production management system, you go through and you list all of the jobs that you have to do in the project. Now some of these jobs are small. They might only be one or two hours. And some of these jobs are enormous and they might take three, take three or four days. They might take the whole two weeks. So you have to classify your features for each sprint, work out what you're doing for each sprint, work on your features, classify the features and give them a weighting of one through four. One for a task that takes a couple of days, sorry, a couple of hours and ones that might take a lot longer. And you, every level up is a doubling. So if it's a one, it's two hours, maybe three, a half a day's work maybe. If it's a two, well maybe it's a day's work. If it's a three, well that would be two days work. And if it's a four, well that would be four days work. So you need to list out and work out all of the small tasks that you have to do. Now production people who turned out being scrum masters, doing this work is a feature in itself. So working out your feature list is a feature, if you get the idea. Actively participate in meetings. You have to be engaged in the Agile process. You must solve conflicts with other people. And if that's not possible, both parties must seek help from management. Don't use email to solve problems. Problems should be solved face to face. And the other thing, if you're in a meeting, leave your phone behind, put it in your pocket. Don't sit there texting other people. Don't sit there on Facebook. 
pay attention during the meetings. You're going to be having daily meetings. They don't last very long. You need to know what is required of you. You need to treat each other with respect and focus on the project as the first priority. The other thing is that you need to respect the team members and their roles. Now remember, it's just a role. It's not personal. The owner is going to have that vision thing and is approving or disapproving of the quality of the work. The scrum manager is going to be helping you get your work done and working on the production management to see whether the team's on track. Every, even the team members have a real, well, they've got the most important role because they're going to be doing the work. So you really have to focus on the team members and, um, and respect each other's role. Now the risk in all of this, when you first set up your scrum methodology, one of the risks is that you're not going to have um, enough decision makers and your schedule is going to be too ambitious for what you're doing. Now this is an this is an example of a production management sheet where you've got you know the various tasks that you're doing. I personally would be doing this in Trello, but you can use a spreadsheet for this sort of work where you're assigning tasks to names. So you've got some people across here, and you've got a whole bunch of tasks here. Now speculate is a planning exercise, and this is where you determine feature-based delivery plan. And in the speculate stage, you work out the cost for each feature and you work out the risks. In the speculate stage, you add any new features that you need for the next cycle. You also look at the previous cycle that you did and if there are any features that didn't get finished in the previous cycle, you add that to the feature list for this um, scrum, for this, for this sprint. So anything that's incomplete also needs to add it because that needs to get finished before you move on to the, next, to, to the new features. A feature is similar to a requirement, but it focuses on a business need. Think of a feature as an action, which is bringing a result. The action is done by a team member. The result is a thing that you have to build or make or design. Write each feature on a sticky note, move them around, organize your features into groups, review. And once you've worked out all your features, you can start working out who's going to be doing each feature. Prioritize, the most important ones should be done first, and so on. Often features are added during the speculate stage, which is great, but you need to have a conversation because if you're adding new features and you've still got a finite amount of time, it means that you might have to give other features less of a priority or remove features altogether. So you need to be at the beginning of each scrum cycle reviewing your, your feature list. And you need to estimate how much time it's going to take for each feature. So if it's the first iteration, you need to estimate the effort put in for all of the iterations and then you can break it down for sprint by sprint. Then you work out the iteration, you work out the milestones and you work out a release plan. Now remember, the first iteration is always going to take longer because it's where you're establishing your norms and it's also where you're working out what you're doing. The explore phase is where you develop the project. You have daily stand-up meetings and brutally honest peer reviews of features as they develop as they developed. Frequent interactions between business and technical personnel and frequent testing. So constantly test your work. Now in the you know, if you're just doing business cards and brochures and so forth, you still need to test. You still need to put it in front of people and see whether they suggest any changes, even if it's not something like user interface testing, where testing is, is very, very important. Um, now in the explore stage, you need to stand up meetings. They're about 15 minutes long. Don't let them drag out much. Don't let them drag out beyond 30 at all. So kill them after 30. If your meetings need to go on longer than 30 minutes, often it's because you're trying to solve problems in that meeting. No, the daily meetings or the, or the time, you know, each time you meet, the meetings are to determine what you are doing today. And in these meetings, each team member discusses what they achieved today, what they plan to achieve today, and, and anything that they, they need help with. And this is where the production of the Scrum Master comes in. He pays attention in the meetings, doesn't say much, listens to what everybody says, and write down, writes down what everybody says. The daily meetings are not the place to resolve issues. Issues should be noted, resolved after the meeting and reported back the next day. So the project manager, the scrub master, plays an observer role during the meetings. He or she allows the team to take the lead 
identify any unresolved issues and resolve them later. So it's the scrum master or the project manager who is resolving any issues. They're the ones who've got to sort it out. They've got to watch for roadblocks, which are things that are stopping people from achieving what it is that they have to do. And you also have to ensure that risks are decreasing over time. You must communicate status with stakeholders. It is your job as a scrum master to enhance productivity, protect the team members, keep any distractions away from the team members, hag- handle any organisational distractions and let the team members get on with their jobs. Now this is a features board. Now some um, scrum teams have this set up in their office, they've got a big wall and they put all their features board and as they finish a feature they move it across into, a, into the finished board or they tag it in some way to say that it's complete. It's the project manager who looks after the features board. And the project manager knows what's going on because he's listening or she is listening during those scrum meetings every time you meet. The completed features are noted. Now I recommend, as I said before, Trello for this. It's an online tool and it allows people who can't see each other every day to collaborate online. The issues register is a list of things that are getting in the way and the issues register is also kept by the production manager or scrum master. Timekeeping is essential. When you're working through, don't get too caught up in the explore phase. You have to keep the sprints on schedule. So after two weeks, finish that sprint and move on to the next. It must finish on time. Very, very important. The adapt stage is the very end of each sprint. It's where you pause and reflect. If anything needs fixing, you fix it and you move on and you either move back to the speculate stage or you close depending on where you are in your project. The adapt stage is where you review the features by the customer. Okay, now just let's go back and have a look. Adapt. The customer reviews the features, documenting the meeting of team members often to reflect on your performance, see how you went, capture any lessons learned and how you could change things for the better. Discuss in this adapt stage what is and isn't working, agree to changes, and plan future sprints. Often adapt is quite short, it's only one day, and in your case it might even be shorter. Adapt confirms if the features are working as expected, they validate the business benefits of the features, they facilitate a lessons learned session, brainstorm to resolve any idea, any issues, add or remove features, modify the stand-up agenda, change team members. Yes, you can fire people off your teams. If your team's not working, you can remove a team member. But I'll tell you one thing, you can't remove a team member in the first cycle. It's not going to happen. Remove non-effective processes, communicate all changes to stakeholders and celebrate prior sprints because if you've been successful in doing a really good job, you need to pat each other on the back and say, hey, well done. Now the close. Close is where everything's done. All of your deliverables are completed. You've reported back to the client, the client's had a look at it, any revisions, any changes have been done. You capture your lessons learned. This is where you invoice your payments. You redeploy your project team. So your project team may need another project to work on. It might be that your team gets split up. It might be that your team in its entirety move across to a new project. You communicate the project results to all the stakeholders and you provide a recap on why Agile worked and what lessons were learned. So, who's on the team? The project owner or sponsor is the person who owns the project. They're the boss, if you like. These are the people with the creative ideas behind the project. And these are the people, it's where the buck stops. If the owner doesn't like the work, you've got to keep creating, you've got to, you've got to fix it, you've got to make it better. The owner has the say. They have the say of approval. So they approve or reject whether your project's good enough to, to close or not. The owner also secures resources, so they need to find the money. They monitor progress. They often are the people who are liaising with the client. It could be that they are the client. These are the people who make all the decisions and they work very closely with the scrum master. Their leader and team member, they are the visionary, they remove any backlog, they work closely of the team, and it is the sponsor who defines the authority of the project manager. So the scrum master works to the owner. 
The Scrum Master, aka Project Manager, leads the planning and development of the project, identifies the deliverables, identifies any risks, directs the team members, including the owner. So yes, the Scrum Master can direct the owner. They scope any changes, maintain all documentation. It's the Scrum Master who resolves any conflicts with the team. Ensure project meets your project meets business objectives, guides rather than leads, but they take a back seat. They lead via coaching, they clear roadblocks, and they, here's a really big one, they allow a decision to take its course. So if the team has decided to do something, they are quite welcome to advise, but it, they don't have say. If the team decides to do something, they just have to let it run its course. They might know better, but they've got to let it run its course so people can learn from their experiences. Now we come to the most important people of the team, the team members themselves. And it's the team members who work out the priority of the feature list because after all, these are the domain experts. These are the people who know what they're doing. So if they say something's important, it's important. They estimate how long each task is going to make and it's the team members who do all of the work. Let's put it this way. If you've only got an owner and a scrum master and no team members, you don't have a team. Now your project data sheet, you do this at the end of your project and it summarizes what you're doing. It's created during the envision stage prior to the first sprint. It's your project um, description, it's your objective. Now this is a living document. So this document, the product project data sheet, is going to change and grow as the project goes on. So just because you've done it once does not necessarily mean it's the last time you touch it. You're constantly updating your project so that if anybody wanted to have an overview of where the project is at, if a combination between your feature board and your project data sheet, they should get an accurate take on where you're at. So in your project data sheet, you'll be putting your burn down charts, your objective, your timelines, your costs, your milestones, your constraints, what priorities. And this is the document that the client reviews to make sure that, that you're on track. As I said, your sprint structure, four to 12 weeks, most, doc, most um, books I've read say, but actually two to 12 weeks is fine. Sprint structure needs to be determined. So you need to work out how each sprint. So you might go for a two week sprint or you might go for a three week sprint. That's up to the team to decide. You know how many weeks you've got less than left in the semester. <laughs> you need to plan one week for spe speculate, one week for adapt. Speculate um, for the first sprint is going to be longer. So the first section, you're going to be working on a little bit longer than the others. Work out the features, the size of the features. Um, now, the sprint structure can be grouped by business priorities, available staff, resources, and by business area. Size estimates are not accurate and can be adjusted. So what you've got to do, here's the thing, at the beginning of your project, you work out how long your sprint is. I like two week sprints, they work for me. Pick a sprint size and stick with it. You cannot change your mind as to what the sprint size is after you start your project. If your sprint takes three weeks and you think it should have, at the beginning you had two week sprints, you've got to make it work in that two week sprint cycle. Now the really important thing is to build high priority features in the first sprint. Now you'll be having daily stand up meetings or certainly every time you meet at least weekly. I highly recommend that even if you can't see each other every day, that you communicate every day and have some sort of meeting. So you should be meeting outside of class as well as inside. Now, in your stand-up meetings, only critical information, try to limit it to 15 minutes. All staff, including especially the Scrum Master, must attend. Now, here's the thing, the Scrum Master doesn't run the meeting, the team members do. So he, he or she has to give the power over to the team members to run the meeting. All the Scrum Master does is write down what the team members are saying. Now, sometimes what you need to do is you have to have the teams present the status in a different order so it doesn't get stale. You need to assign a timekeeper so you don't go over your 15 minutes. Allow 30 to 60 seconds per person. Rotate the timekeeper. Don't try to resolve issues in your Scrum meeting. That's for a later meeting. Organize a meeting later on and sort that out. Try to hold your Scrum meetings at the same time every day and allow five minutes of questions at the end. 
Collaboration and risks. Well, is your team collaborating? What risks are surfacing? Are there common issues that are resolved? Is your list of issues growing? And if it is, you need to look at them and start addressing them. It's like an RO moment. Are some team members struggling with the agile process? Now, at the end of each scrum cycle, at at the end of each sprint, end on a positive note. If you've done something really well, you guys should celebrate. Really good. You know, pat each other on the back. Keep the positive momentum going because these things get stale quite quickly. So your meetings can be two times a week because you're probably in, you're in, you know you're only in class once a week. Um, please invite other stakeholders. So you know you might want to invite your tutor to come to one of your meetings, or you might might want to inv- invite your lecturer to come to the meetings, or you might even want to invite someone from another team because they might give you insights as to what you might be doing wrong in your in your scrum meetings and in your project now here's an example of a burn down chart along the x-axis here you've got the to, uh, the timeline the y-axis is the number of work needed is, is the amount of work needed to achieve the sprint the start date is to the left the end date is to the right and with a burn down chart you can actually map the actual work completed tracked against the estimate the features can be controlled, so you can add or reduce two features to maintain your timeline. If you're finding that you're drifting and you're not progressing, you need to start removing features or simplifying what you're doing. And your burned out chart aligns your plan with your ability to produce features. And by using a, a one burned out chart, creating one burned out chart for each sprint, you get a sense of how you're going in your project. So I highly recommend you do a burned out chart for the overall project and you do separate ones for each sprint so you can work out how you're going with each sprint. And here's some nice references for you um, so you can indeed um, learn about the Agile process. So I'm going to be hopefully available on Skype to answer your questions for those of you uh, there on a Tuesday and for those of you in my class on a Thursday, I'll answer your questions there.